Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining me once again. Where today we're dealing with people who continue to want to espouse falsehoods, fallacies, ideological claptrap, propaganda, fear mongery, and spin doctrine upon the unsuspecting public of the interwebs. Uh, I'm here to put them right where they're wrong, which is everywhere. You're welcome. Let's crack on with this one. This one is a presentation recorded by and posted by a channel called Vegan Linked, which is a propaganda channel, obviously, which would like you to believe for some reason that the eating of plants is indicated and the eating of animals is somehow not. Right, so let's crack on, shall we? Make some progress and see what it is the folks from Vegan Linked have to say about veganism and stuff. And we'll put them right where they're wrong. Point wise, in our usual style. Off you go. Welcome to Plant Based Diets What the Science Says. Dr. Constance Lee is the founder. Yes, what the science says. Um, this video should probably actually be entitled What the Speaker Would Like the Science to Say in Her Ideal World, According to Her Opinions of What She Thinks would be a good thing if the science did say. What she's actually not going to do is get anywhere near what the science actually does say. But we'll get to that as we go along. Off you go, Dr. Constance Lee. ...of the Medical Vegetarian Society and Just My Doc, which is a private telehealth practice which provides patients with direct access to physicians in her talk. So she will go over the scientific research behind plant-based diets and their effects on chronic diseases like cancer, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes. She'll also review some of the pitfalls to avoid with plant-based diets. Like being on one at all. I doubt she's going to say that, though. Such as some micronutrient deficiencies and how to make sure you get a complete protein profile. So well, that's easy. Eat meat. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Constance Lee. Thank you. Gosh, they're keen, aren't they? Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you all for being here today. You're very welcome. Just a little bit more background about me. When I was in the Vegetarian Society in medical school, we uh, started a organic garden on school grounds and gave away healthy food. You gave away meat and fat. What has it got to do with gardening? to the community. After I graduated residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation, I went on to found my own private practice called Just My Doc based in Philadelphia. Not a lot of people know what physical medicine and rehab is, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview. I see patients who have had strokes amputations, brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, and any kind of issue concerning their muscles, nerves, and connective tissues. So usually patients come to me after major medical illnesses or injuries, and I help them to function better again in as comfortable of a way as possible to improve their quality of life. And I've seen the downstream effects of many chronic diseases, which I'll be discussing today. Reviewing the strongest evidence about plant-based diets and their effect on cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer. Well, that's going to be a problem because the word you've chosen there is, well, there are several words that are problematic there. The first word, evidence. Well, you're not going to present any because there is no evidence of a cause and effect nature extant anywhere in the literature that can inform upon health outcomes as those relate to human beings over any period of time in response to any intervention, nutritionally, diet-wise, of any kind whatsoever. And if you say otherwise, all you're going to do is show your incompetence to read science and to, and to understand what the disciplines and process of science actually are, something in which I'm actually quite expert. If you look into my background, you'll see that that is so. The other problem that you've chosen there that is very, very problematic is the one I've already alluded to, and that's effect. Effect is the conjugate of cause, cause and effect. So if you want to talk about effects, you are implying cause. If you want to imply cause, you will need to show me an experimental, interventional, properly designed, properly powered, properly randomized, properly controlled, properly observed metabolic ward lock-in study in human beings 
over the period of time that you want to extrapolate your findings to. So if that's multiple decades, that's how long we'll need to see some data from people locked in labs under those conditions with everything controlled for you to talk about cause and effect. Otherwise, we're done here. It's going to be a real short video, or it would be, but we'll let you speak to the end of your video anyway, and we'll just correct you every single time you make a statement about cause and effect, because there is no evidence for cause and effect extant anywhere. Sorry about that. What's next? And then we're going to discuss uh, the state of protein and fiber in the U.S. So apologies for our more international audience, but um, it is a concern about what's going on in the U.S. because the Western diet is uh, spreading rapidly. We'll go over B12 as a common micronutrient deficiency in plant-based diets. Really? That's a shock. And then if we have some time, we'll also go over uh, common misconceptions about omega-3. That'll be interesting if you get to it, because you'll probably get that wrong too. So we'll start off with cardiovascular disease. Right, oh, let's. Cardio means heart. Thanks. Vascular means blood vessel. Awesome. Very good. You're doing well so far. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. This is a class of conditions that involves heart attacks and strokes. And et cetera, apparently. But it really affects every single part of the body. Sure. Or can do. What we mean by cardiovascular disease usually is a buildup of plaques yes that contain cholesterol indeed they do yes at around about five percent by volume 95 percent is not cholesterol and actually even if they were 100 percent cholesterol so what all in our blood vessels when the plaque builds up in the arteries to the heart they can cause a heart attack that's true but what's that got to do with cholesterol other than nothing at all when they build up in the arteries that go to the brain, they can cause a stroke. Also true, but also still nothing to do with cholesterol. And this can happen to any organ in the body. And this happens not just in old age, but it actually happens at a very early age. Uh, people as young as 20 have been found to have plaque buildup. Yeah, younger than that too, actually in their arteries so the earlier we're able also you'll find that it has no correlation of any utility with cholesterol levels actually interesting isn't it well to address this process and nip it in the bud the better off we'll be when we're older but the only way to nip a process like that in the bud is to understand what its underlying etiology cause is dr lee which you clearly don't, because you're pointing the finger at cholesterol there by failure to make a clear statement to the contrary, as I have done. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Unequivocally. No question. We're done. Uh, what's next? And why should we care about this? It is actually the number one killer in the U.S. Yes. And so we should deal with the heart disease problem, but we're not going to deal with it by intervening in one of the variables that has no causal relationship to the outcome, cholesterol, that will not affect heart disease outcomes. So, <laughs> dear idea. And responsible for a third of deaths in America. And why does plaque build up in our arteries? Oh, here we go. This will be interesting. Is Unfortunately, a lot of it has to do... Are you serious? This is your explanation for heart disease? Parsimonious much? Simplified to the, to the nth degree much, is it? Hmm. Dear, oh dear. Appalling. Really, really bad. Saturated fat, cholesterol, neither of which have any role to play in heart disease whatsoever. Fiber. Also, if anything, fiber will make heart disease more likely, not less. LDL, a form of lipoprotein transporter for cholesterol and other lipids in the blood, plays no causal role in heart disease, whatever. Arteries, yes, a clear one and one that's got some plaque in it. Uh, HDL, which plays very little role actually in the heart disease process either. And then back to liver. That's it? Seriously? Hmm.
Right, so what we're getting here is cholesterol is bad. Okay? Saturated fat is bad. Okay? But we're not getting any explanation of how that could possibly actually remotely be so in any way. It's not so, by the way. With genetics, but there are some modifiable risk factors. No, risk, see, risk is another cause and effect statement. What you are implying by lack of a clear statement to the contrary is that if you modify a given factor, that as an individual and in person in the world, that will have a predictable modifying effect on your individual risk of any given outcome. Personally, you. Prospective cohort studies cannot inform on that at all, and they don't inform on that. What's next? Such as cholesterol level that we... No, that's not a risk factor. It's not even an associate to heart disease to speak of at all. Even if it were meaningfully associated, the analogy, the, the most sensible analogy is to say, well, yes, every single time we see footage on television of a major forest fire event, every single time firefighters are seen in these shots scurrying around doing firefighting. Ergo, the cause of forest fires is firefighting crews, and the way to deal with the forest fire scourge is to eliminate fire crews. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely, fundamentally, utterly ridiculous from the ground up. It holds no water. It stands not even the most basic cursory refutation. It's uh, another analogy is like saying, well, you know, if we correlate the sale of ice creams at Miami Beach with sunburn reported, from people who have been at Miami Beach that day, what we'll find is a very strong, powerful correlation, in fact, between the sale of ice creams that day and sunburn reports that day. Ergo, we deal with the sunburn problem by outlawing, this, outlawing the sale of ice creams. It is ridiculous. We are done. What is next? We have control over through diet and exercise. Who has In actual fact, diet and exercise play very little role in the control of one's cholesterol levels. So you haven't even got that right. Ever heard of uh, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? Ooh, ooh, me, 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 says the bloke in green. I wonder if that's not Dr. Greger. Looks like not Dr. Greger from the back, doesn't it? If you don't eat your fruits and vegetables, you might die. Did you know that? All right. There is no such thing, by the way, as good and bad cholesterol at all. Complete fallacy. So quite a number of people. And it's a fallacy. It does not exist. There is only one form of cholesterol. It's called cholesterol. It's a molecule where you can look up in any textbook you like and you won't find two forms of it. There is only one. So who actually knows what this means? Well, clearly not you. Oh, 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 not Dr. Gregor knows. Dr. G. Uh, I was right. <laughs> it is him. <laughs> oh, my word, my word, my word, my word. Oh, <laughs> he has no idea, and he's not a doctor, by the way, Dr. Lee. Michael Greger is not a physician. Okay, what's next? And a couple of people in the audience. All right, so we'll go over the basics here. No, you won't. You'll get it wrong. Cholesterol is a very diverse group of molecules. No, it isn't. It's one and one only. There is only one form of cholesterol. There is only one molecule called cholesterol. It's not diverse at all. Wrong. Some types are beneficial. No, there is only one type. Whereas other types can be damaging. Nonsense. There is only one type still. Commonly, the shorthand bad cholesterol is... It's not cholesterol. ...also known as LDL. Or it's not cholesterol, love. LDL is not cholesterol. Okay? It's pretty straightforward, neither is it bad, by the way. It's a lipoprotein that exists precisely because there's a length of DNA inside every single cell in your body that instructs those cells to make the stuff. Only some of the cells express and activate that gene. LDL is made in one of your organs in particular. Um, nonetheless, every single one of your cells has the DNA to do it. Okay? Um, the reason that that DNA is there is because it has survived the entire history of the universe in terms of an evolutionary process. It's there for a reason.
Okay, it's there to produce the carrier, the transport molecule for cholesterol, which comes in one and only one form. All right, it's very straightforward, very simple. Um, it has a purpose that has a utility. It has some DNA that encodes for it. Jobs are good in. What's next? Or low density lipoprotein. And this comes um, from the liver. Yes. And delivers cholesterol to the rest of our body. It's not a good thing because 50% by weight and volume of every single cell membrane of every single cell in your body is cholesterol. And when your cells become damaged for any reason, the base material, I guess, for the repair of such cell membranes is cholesterol, and so it needs to be delivered there. Isn't it a great thing that we have a means of getting cholesterol to those cells through the blood, which it otherwise wouldn't dissolve in because it's a lipid, and blood is water-based. That's why we have the transporter. That's what it exists for. So it's actually very good. Shall we move on? This is helpful because we need cholesterol uh, for all of our organs to function. Correct. Uh, not just organs. Uh, cholesterol plays myriad roles in human metabolism, fitness, health, wellness, well-being. Without sufficient cholesterol, you will die, and you will die very quickly. Okay, what's next? Properly. When it becomes damaging is when the LDL becomes too high. No, not at all. False. Wrong. <laughs> just, just no. That's not what happens at all, actually. What happens when atherosclerosis begins is it's an inflammatory immune dysfunction cascade of events. The first requisite is absolutely inflammation of the epithelial cells in the vascular tree. The second requisite is an aberrant pressure profile in certain geographical selected zones within the tree where atherosclerosis invariably develop. And thirdly, it's very, very helpful if there is some chemical and or oxidative derangement to the lipoproteins. Okay? Absent any of those, atherosclerosis does not occur under the influence of any concentration of LDL or cholesterol or any other lipoproteins or subfraction of the lipoproteins either, in fact. All right? Very straightforward. What's next? And then it starts depositing cholesterol into our blood vessels. Not at all. Remember, atherosclerotic plaques are about 5% cholesterol by volume. Five. And it's there in an attempt to repair the damage that is being done that it's not keeping pace with because the rate of damage is exceeding the rate of repair. Ergo, 95% of the atherosclerotic plaques are things other than cholesterol, such as scar tissue. Okay? to cause plaque. You can no, cholesterol does not cause plaque. Not at all. No. Think of these uh, like dust bunnies over there that uh, go around and, and, and clog uh, our arteries. You could think of them that way, but you'd be wrong because they're nothing of the sort. They're nothing remotely similar to that. Utter nonsense. Whereas the good cholesterol... Doesn't exist either. There's only one form of cholesterol. Remember, it's called cholesterol. Only one molecule. Uh, refers to something called HDL. Which is also not cholesterol. You're doing, you're doing a great job, love. You really are. It's incredible. By which I mean completely lacking in any credibility whatsoever. No wonder not Dr. Gregor is sitting there and lapping it up and loving it. High density lipoprotein. And these are actually helpful in removing the LDL from our arteries and returning it back to the liver. No. Not necessarily. So you can think of these as the vacuum cleaners that remove the dust bunnies. No. HDL is a carrier of cholesterol, not other lipoproteins. You silly girl. You haven't even got the basics right. You do not understand the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis at all, clearly. You have no idea whatever of the etiology of atherosclerosis. This is embarrassing for you, or it should be. So there's a lot of different factors that influence your levels of good and bad cholesterol. It still doesn't exist. Generally, the biggest controllable risk factor for raising bad cholesterol is- There is still no such thing. Diet. No, false again on that.
The levels of lipoproteins of all sorts in your blood are under the control of your genes almost entirely, not your diet. Eating lots of saturated fat and cholesterol while having low fiber is going to raise bad cholesterol. There is no such thing still. Um, this is opposed to the biggest influence on good cholesterol. Which still doesn't exist either. Which is getting lots of exercise. No. The levels of each kind of cholesterol are managed by... There's only one, still. ...the liver, which processes all the dietary fat and cholesterol that we eat. But a good mnemonic is that uh, you generally want your LDL to be low. Wrong. Completely false. And your HDL to be high. False again. Also not true. The levels of lipoproteins in your blood are set by your genes. Those genes know what they're doing and they adjust what the levels are at various times according to the situation, the environment in which you place your genes to best effect. What we ought to do is leave the genes to it. They know what they're doing and you clearly do not love. Hi. All right, so now that we've established that cardiovascular disease is very important. Well, yes, we agree on that, but you haven't got anything whatsoever right about the etiology of heart disease yet. Not a single thing. Not even basic first principles. And we have a handle on how it develops. Let's look. No, you don't. Clearly, you have absolutely no idea how it develops or even what the makeup is of an atherosclerotic plaque, let alone how it's caused. Ridiculous. Get the research. Oh, yes, huh. let's look at some research. Good. For all, it's difficult to study the connection between diet and chronic diseases because. Impossible, in fact. It's hard to control exactly what people eat. Impossible, in fact, unless you lock them in labs for years. That's my whole point. We're done here. So we have to rely on self-reports, which increases the chance of inaccuracy. Makes it certain, in fact. Invalidates the study right there. We are done. But you're clearly not, because you've still got the vast majority of your video remaining. Also, these chronic diseases take a very long time to develop. Indeed. And so how we mitigate these uh, difficulties in researching diet on chronic... Is by ignoring them completely, throwing all the disciplines out the window and doing some pseudoscience instead, pretending that that's anywhere close or akin to actual science. That's what you do. Diseases is that we get um, research studies that have a lot of participants and we... Well, that doesn't matter how many participants you have, if you haven't adequately randomized, designed, controlled, observed, you haven't done any science and you haven't established cause and effect. You've established associations, at least you would have done, if at the end of your prospective cohort study, you report what you actually observed, which they don't do either. First, they adjust what they observed. In other words, take the observations that they actually made, screw them up and throw them over their shoulder into the ash can and publish something they made up instead. Wow. Uh, follow them for a very long period of time. Harvard ran such a study to evaluate the effects of meat. No, no effects, because effect is the conjugate of cause. They did no such study. They looked at associations, and then they ignored what they saw in terms of those associations and reported something different, as I've just said. Something they made up. It belongs in the fiction section, love. Okay, this is not science or anything closely akin to science. Epidemiology is hypothesis generating pilot work, no matter the sample size or the length of time over which people are so called followed or followed up on, if you like. Science is done experimentally. If you don't do the experimental science, you have not established the case. Case dismissed. Bang the gavel. We are out of here. But you're still not done for some reason. Okay consumption on cardiovascular disease. They followed over 120,000 people mm -hmm. over 22 to 28 years. Right here. Over this time, they gathered 24,000 data points on people passing away. Fantastic. Should we get out a calculator just for a moment to deal with what they actually have there as a starting baseline? Here is the calculator. Let's say 121,000 individuals. Let's take the lower amount of follow-up, the lower bound there, the 22 years. So we're going to multiply that 121,000 by 22 years, giving us 
An end result that tells us that we have 2,662,000 person years of follow up. Fantastic. Fantastic. Let's put that in the old memory bank, shall we? And we'll clear that away so that we can now look at the number of cases of mortality at 24,000. I doubt it was exactly 24,000, but what the hell, that seems like it's been rounded, but okay, whatever, fine. We're going to divide that by the memory return figure. And what we're going to get there is nine deaths per thousand person years of follow up nine that is not a huge baseline incidence is it no it isn't all right so that's we need to keep that in mind baseline incidence of mortality Nine per thousand person years of follow up total. Okay. And were able to compare their cause of death with their reported diet. The results showed that eating red meat, whether processed or unprocessed, significantly increased the risk of death from cardiovascular. Well, there's a 20% relative difference there. But what's 20% of nine? Should we get the calculator out again, just to make sure we don't make any arithmetical errors? Okie dokie. So, 9 times 0 0.20 is 1.8. So, the difference, if this was a cause and effect relationship, which it isn't, because there are so many degrees of freedom at play here, so many collinearities, covariances, muddying of the waters, it will have been adjusted as well, in other words, fabricated anyway. Um, but what we've got there is a difference of 1.8 chances, if you like, of death from any cause per thousand person years of follow-up. The other thing that's of interest, by the way, is that the age of the people at the start of the follow-up period was already hugely advanced. Of course it was, because you can't do these kind of studies with young folks, because young folks tend to die even less often than older folks, as it turns out, and then you can't even get statistically significant results. So this study is only applicable, even if it was cause and effect, which it still isn't, to people beyond the average age of the cohort that was studied in this particular study that they've fabricated and made up the results to. Whoops. Oh dear. Not science is what I'm telling you. What's next? Disease. This effect was even more pronounced for- Effect, no, effect is the conjugate of cause still, and this is not a cause and effect study, so no. Other causes like cancer. So the first blue bar you see um, on the right is a baseline for the risk of death of a person who- No, incidence. No red meat. No, someone that reported eating no red meat. Okay? Stop misrepresenting the facts here, love. It's ridiculous. Out the study. And as soon as uh, people ate just one serving of unprocessed red meat a day. No, that's what they reported. Or more. Their risk of dying from a heart attack or a stroke. No, not risk, because that's the conjugate of cause. Still, this is reported incidents once it's been adjusted jumped up 18% as shown. Yes, but that's nothing, isn't it? Nothing at all. By the red bar. If this serving was actually processed uh, red meat, like ham or hot dogs, this jumped another three percentage points. Which is still nothing overall because of the very low baseline incidence in the first instance. Plus, you forgot to delimit these findings to only people over the average age of the people in this particular cohort of 121,000 aged people. All right, next we'll cover the evidence for diabetes. That's it? For heart disease? That's all you've got? 
Gosh, of course I knew that's all you had. That kind of thing. There are a number of studies that report similar things. Absolutely. None of them establish the case. None of them give us anything to worry about, even if they did report a cause and effect relationship, which they still don't. Okay? These. And again, we'll start off with the basics. So, oh, which you're going to get wrong as well, I imagine. Who's heard of type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Oh, oh, I wonder if not Dr. Greger has. Yep, first hand up. Great, a lot of people. And uh, who knows what the difference is? Uh, oh, Dr. Greger again. Not Dr. Greger, I should say. Again. Ooh, 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 pick okay, me. Okay, less people. <laughs> Diabetes is all uh, surrounding a little hormone called insulin. No, it isn't. Not at all. False. I knew she was going to get that wrong. <laughs> Diabetes is elevated blood sugar and nothing else. That's how it's diagnosed. That's what the pathology is. That's what interventions are based around achieving. <laughs> nothing to do with insulin. Insulin plays a role in glucose homeostasis, sure, but it responds to what the situation is. It's not the cause of any pathology of any kind. Okay? I've covered that in great detail on my channel if people want to go and check that out. Which is produced in our pancreas. Yes, it is. You got that right. Congratulations. And is responsible for moving all the uh, sugar or glucose in our blood into our cells where it can be metabolized. No, it's not responsible for doing any such thing at all. It's responsible for stimulating cells that require glucose to absorb it from the blood. Should a cell be fully replete with energy in the form of fat, for example, or indeed fat and carbohydrate already in that cell, and it requires no further input of energy, then it will lock the doors to glucose, and the insulin will have no effect on that cell. The insulin is unchanged, its job is unchanged, and its ability to do that job is unchanged. It just needs to wait for the cell to be ready to accept that input again, and the cell will not be ready to do that until its energy reserves drop. Okay? Goodness gracious, this person holds a medical degree. Can you believe that? To energy. In type 1 diabetes, the main issue is that we're not producing enough insulin. This is often called juvenile diabetes and is mainly caused by genetics or a viral infection which damages the pancreas. So these people usually have to supplement with uh, insulin. Using Unless they don't consume carbohydrates in an unnecessary and ridiculous level, in which case, sure, they will still need to, to add some exogenous insulin because you still need a small amount, but the amount they need and the form that they uh, require will be vastly less and vastly slower acting, actually. The problem is still too much consumption of unnecessary contraindicated poisonous glucose and glucose producing substances such as, well, all carbohydrates except fructose. Well, fructose still does, actually, in a roundabout way as well. So what's next? They have to give themselves injections, and this starts at quite a young age. Well, as soon as the type 1 diabetes is established is when the treatment begins. On the other hand, type 2 diabetes is actually resistance to insulin. No, it isn't. It's too much blood sugar because you are pouring too much sugar down your neck, and that's all it is. Nothing else. Um, our cells, even though they're getting plenty of uh, insulin attached to their receptors, they're... No, it's not attaching. That's why it's not doing its job. And it's not attaching precisely because it's not allowed to attach because the GLUT4 transporter has been bound from the inside by cyclic AMP kinase under the influence of having plenty of energy on board the cell already, thus to basically stick a key in the inside of the lock and stop the outdoor side key the insulin from forcing glucose into that cell where it doesn't need it, where it would be ultimately damaging to that cell. Okay? Not a pathology. Proper functioning of cells to protect themselves. Really straightforward when you actually get a, get a handle on this, which you clearly haven't got. Any more than the handle you might think you have on heart disease, which you don't either. Not able to respond to it. Usually this is adult onset, so it happens later in life. Not so much these days. It happens much, much younger these days because, well, kids are being fed with more and more dangerous, contraindicated, toxic carbohydrates. 
and is dependent on a number of lifestyle factors and in the medical community we generally correlate obesity with the development of type 2 diabetes as gosh that's a shock i wonder why that would be it's number one risk factor no no diabetes is not caused by obesity obesity is caused by diabetes <laughs> for goodness sake diabetes being elevated blood glucose and nothing else remember and these people may or may not be insulin dependent they can all, they can take medications which increase uh, their cells response to insulin or they could stop pouring carbohydrates down their stupid fucking necks couldn't they yes what's next at a time but excuse my french if it progresses eventually they do uh, burn out their pancreas and then become uh, insulin dependent well that's why they should stop pouring carbohydrates down their neck then isn't it so how concerned should we be about diabetes very here's some background epidemiology for the oh good epidemiology again our favorite boys and girls let's hear it well so we can account for how many people are affected currently mm -hmm. about one in four people have prediabetes and are likely to develop type 2 diabetes in their lifetime mm -hmm. and if the trend of rising levels of diabetes continues it's predicted that one in three children born after the year 2000 will develop diabetes at some point terrifying isn't it guess who gets to pay for that so why does this actually matter well because you and i have to pay for that is it just to the extent that these people may have to take insulin and medications for the rest of their lives no of course not sure they need to do that in order to regulate their blood sugars um no the way to regulate their blood sugars is to stop pouring things down their neck that are immediately metabolically turned into sugar okay no drugs required and this can often feel like a game that they can never stop playing. And that's hard enough as it is, but uh, what does it actually look like if they're bad at playing this game and then they have to deal with years of accumulated damage from high blood sugars? Well, it's obesity, it's heart disease, it's amputations, it's benefits that need to be paid, disability benefits, that is, you know, all those kind of things. So unfortunately, I see this in the hospital all the time, and it doesn't look pretty. Diabetes, while not a direct killer like heart attack or stroke. Yeah, it is a direct killer. You don't even have that right, do you, love? Diabetes will kill you directly. Is still hugely important to our quality of life and the development of other chronic or deadly conditions. <laughs> It can cause small vessel disease and inflammation throughout the body, which can lead to slow and devastating damage. Again right, and you're promoting a diet to people which will only lead to an exacerbation of the diabetic pathology, that being elevated blood glucose and nothing else. You ought to be imprisoned, stripped of any medical credentialing, lined up in the street and pummeled with rotten tomatoes shame 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 ding 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 shame shame what's next again we can see the plaque development it really accelerates development of plaque in the arteries so it's actually a really big risk factor for the development of heart attacks and stroke and cardiovascular disease in the future no correlate not risk factor it's a strong correlate it's a different thing the language here is important the retina in the eyes um, can start to get inflammation in their blood vessels and the retina can hemorrhage uh, which can cause blindness in people that is slowly progressive and not reversible by eyeglasses when it happens in yeah but why would you try and heal such a thing with eyeglasses that's not the way to heal an eye injury obviously goodness sake anybody here keen to go and consult with this particular physician about anything medical at all in the kidneys the kidneys can get small and scarred and non-functional and people can eventually become dependent on dialysis where they have to go to a center to get hooked up to it's a almost as if you need to stop pouring carbohydrates down your neck 
an external kidney three times a week, and this takes hours of time. This can also result in nerve damage, especially... Don't forget the cost of it, because I don't actually care how long a diabetic has to sit there doing their thing. That's, that doesn't confront me. What confronts me is the cost of it, if I have to pay for it. In many countries, taxes go towards health. In many countries, health is not privatised. The country I live in, it's not privatised. We all have to pay. It's the same in the UK. I believe you have a, a blended model in the US between some public, but mostly it's insurance-based. Probably a better model, but also has its flaws as well, of course. That's for another day. The nerves that are longer and further away from the body, so they don't get delivery of blood as easily. And this can result in something called neuropathy, where the nerves don't function. And we get numbness and tingling that can be permanent. And finally, this is near and dear to my specialty. People can get really poor wound healing because they're not getting oxygen delivery to their feet and their hands. And when they get a small little cut, this can develop into a really bad ulcer. And it's, it's even worse because they oftentimes can't feel their feet. So Don't forget gangrene, which can know. result leading to amputation know when they're getting an injury and over time when these wounds don't heal they can get infected and then this leads to amputations all right so now that we know the prevalence oh the adventist health study number two my favorite we'll get to this one this is great and the potential devastation of diabetes let's look at the research we can look at the adventist health study which studied what they did in fact is they followed a bunch of people who were aged at the outset as well of course because all of these studies are of that nature what they also did was adjusted their raw observations that they made so hugely and so inappropriately that they turned the incidence of mortality from all causes and every underlying subcause of mortality and disease prevalence all on their heads 180 degrees out of phase with what was actually observed in the population they looked at this is a study run by a bunch of theologues from the Loma Linda University and the results absolutely reflect what their canon required them to say that they would reflect they adjusted their data so heavily to make it fit their canon, their religious doctrine, their good book, if you like, that this whole study is an absolute joke. Anyone that's remotely competent in statistics can go to that study and look at those raw statistics and see how heavily they have been adjusted from what was observed. This study is not worth the paper it would be written on were it written on paper. It's nonsense. We are done with this study, but you're not. Let's hear it. Almost 100,000 Adventist church members, and this was a good population to study. No, it's not, because it's not representative at all of the general population. Because a lot of them are vegans or vegetarians. That doesn't make it good. That makes it inapplicable to the society at whole, at large. So we have a good number of them in, and they have very similar lifestyle factors, so there's not... Not necessarily. Just because they attend the same church, you have no idea what they do behind closed doors because they weren't observed. They were left under their own recognizance to live their lives, not science. Too much variation to, a, to control for. They tracked these participants every two years uh, on a whole range of health data. And these charts are arranged by the diets that are highest in animal products on the left in red. And yeah, but as I say, if you look at the actual raw incidence data, you will find every single one of those has been turned around 180 degrees from the reality. The lowest incidence was at the left on the red bar in absolute terms, and the highest incidence was in the vegans. For every single health problem and mortality in that study, every single one. Go and look at the raw statistics of the thing. <laughs> Incredible, which once again, to remind you, means lacking entirely in credibility.
And then the diets that were lowest in animal products, the vegans in blue, and it was found that as people had less animal products in their diet, they had lower BMI, which... No, it wasn't found. That wasn't found at all. It was adjusted. Okay? Traditionally, we correlate with a predisposition for diabetes. And then this is reflected well in the... Which is also false because you've got the causality 180 degrees out of phase. Diabetes causes obesity, not the other way around. Diabetes being elevated blood glucose, remember, and nothing else. Prevalence of diabetes, where as you ate less animal products, you're less likely to have developed diabetes. Nonsense. The exact opposite was true, as I've said. How do we actually say that this is not just correlated to body mass index? It wasn't. Even if it was, you, you can't say that. It's a collinearity. It's a complete confound. You cannot extrapolate that out. You cannot partition cause and effect contributors out as to 50% body mass index, 50% smoking, 20%. You can't do that. It is not possible. We are done with this ridiculous theological piece of claptrap, Dr. Lee. We said earlier that uh, this was considered the biggest risk factor, but... No, not risk factor. Risk is the conjugate of cause, still. But the statisticians in this study actually accounted for that. No, they didn't, because it is not possible. What they did is what's called a multiple regression analysis, which is something that most people don't understand even what that is, let alone remotely how it might be done, and so therefore they accept it as being scientifically valid and go, oh yes, that's good, and sign off on it. It's no good. You cannot establish cause and effect with a single variate regression. So what makes you think, in a purple fit, that you can establish causality using multiple variates, each one of which contributes an error? And maybe collinear, in which case the covariate becomes immediately invalid. Example. Risk of death because of smoking and adjusted for age. Well, no, because the longer you smoke, the older you will be. It's collinear. You can't take age out of there. <laughs> Goodness sake, this isn't rocket science or difficult to understand if you've actually got more than three brain cells, I would have thought. Or even more than five minutes, actually, of being exposed to the fallacies of epidemiological claptrappery and statistical inference. Okay? This is why people like you, Dr. Lee, who have clearly no training in this field, should not be commenting publicly in this field. You are incompetent to do so. You don't see me giving medical advice, do you? No. Neither do you see Dr. Gregor doing that. <clears throat> well, you actually do from time to time, but you shouldn't because he's not a doctor. Never practiced a day in his life. And so they did some fancy math and... Uh, the, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, they did some fancy math. You have no idea what they did, do you? You would have no idea where to even start doing a multiple regression analysis, would you? Not at all. Did for a whole host of risk factors. No, they didn't. No. Associates, none of which were risk factors, because none of which are the conjugate of causes. Okay. Which is BMI, age. There you go, collinearity, we're done. Because the older you get, the more likely you are to be fat. So you can't take age out. Because that's going to affect everything else and invalidate your assertion, your fantasy your work of fiction that belongs in that section and not in the science side of things, okay? Sex, ethnicity, and... No. <laughs> also, how do you adjust a continuous variable for a categorical, other than using a logistic regression, which adds so much error as it becomes laughable? Of course, you'd understand that if, you've, if you'd had any exposure whatever, 
to studying statistical inference or research design in any way, shape or form at any time during your medical degree, which I suspect you didn't. Ergo, you should not be speaking publicly in this field at all. Okay? Physical activity, and still they found that vegans were half as likely to develop diabetes. No, they didn't. That's a number they made up because they used a regression sum to alter what they actually observed. See, scientists design studies properly, control them properly, observe them properly, randomize them properly, power them properly, all of that, and then they report what it is they actually did observe. Epidemiologists control nothing, randomize nothing, intervene in no way whatsoever, and then don't report what they even saw. Please! Hello? What's next? Compared to the non-vegetarians. So there seems to be some compelling evidence that there's... No! See, compelling means you have to agree. There's no way to argue against it. I've been arguing against everything you've had to say with actual facts, actual science, and actual knowledge in the field for nearly an hour. So it's not compelling, is it? Another false use of language from you, love. What's next? Either something about a plant-based diet that's protective against diabetes? No, see, protective is a cause and effect statement, again, which you don't have any evidence for whatsoever, because you haven't just produced any evidence at all. You've produced a work of fiction, an anti-scientific piece of propaganda, not science. Please, or this, this talk is entitled What the Science Says. And you've given us propaganda, not science. Goodness gracious. I hope it gets better. I know it's not going to. Don't panic. Something about animal products that predisposes one to diabetes. Nonsense. No such thing is in fact true. The exact opposite is in fact true. Um, provided that you remove the carbohydrate, the unnecessary carbohydrate from the diet. The single biggest cause of diabetes is the Randall cycle. Perhaps you should go and look that up. All right, next we're going to cover the evidence for plant-based No, diet. you're not, because there isn't any, still. It's in cancer. No, you're not. So for this... Oh, so now you're going to refer to an organization with exactly no credibility whatsoever remaining. Just to make absolutely certain that there's no way in the world anyone with more than two brain cells will take you seriously for even a second. The moment you invoke this organization as any kind of authority on anything whatsoever, except self-claimed authority, you're done. You're finished here. <laughs> wow. I relied off of the rigorous compilation. There of is nothing rigorous about anything this organization is involved in except propaganda and mass genocide. The evidence compiled by the organization. Now, it takes a lot for the organization to give out recommendations. No, it doesn't. And say, well, the only thing it takes a lot of is money. There's actually evidence for a connection between a risk factor and a disease. No. There are no established risk factors in terms of nutrition and health outcomes in human beings, because it's still a conjugative cause. There are still no experiments upon which to rely to make such an inference. For this study, they considered over 800 different studies on cancer and diets. And there they... were no studies that experimentally look at cancer in human beings at all. Never have been, this... never will be down to uh, 10 studies that were the most rigorous. No, they weren't. And found that for every 50 gram portion of processed meat, the risk of colorectal cancer. No, cause and effect statement, false. Increases about 18%. No, only in the presence of carbohydrate as well. The Randall cycle is the issue there, not the meat. There are no studies on people who eat meat and not carbohydrates. So these are their official statements. So what? They have no meaning. They are not based in science. Not an organization that is remotely worthy of listening to on any topic ever again. They should be disbanded, actually, and all their members ought to be imprisoned for genocide.
So for red meat, which is like steak or pork, they found that it's probably carcinogenic to humans. No, they didn't find anything of the sort. That is a cause and effect statement. There is no evidence to support it. And that's actually a, a very big uh, statement from the world. Yes, it is a big statement, but that doesn't make it correct. It isn't. And it, it was most strongly correlated to colorectal cancer, which you can see right here. This is a colon that was uh, opened up. On the left over here, you see a nice normal colon tissue. And are you going to provide us with a correlation statistic? Or are you just going to tell us it was most strongly correlated? Because I can tell you what the level of correlation was. Basically nothing to any given living human being over a 100-year life span. Still. And then on the right, you can actually see this, like, angry, lumpy, red polyp, and that's cancer. Yes. Cancer is a terrible thing. No argument. However, you are not providing any evidence whatsoever that cancer is connected cause and effect with anything else. Because it doesn't exist. That's what it looks like. There yes, we know what it looks like. Well, those of us that have seen it before. Yes, absolutely. Also, uh, some evidence that showed that there was an association with red meat and pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. No, there isn't a meaningful association, let alone a cause and effect relationship established. False again. Cancer as well. Next, for processed meat, um, the evidence was even more damning. No, no it isn't. At all. Wrong again. Another incompetent reading of the statistical inference provided and its underpinning, underlying meaning, validity, utility, etc. Uh, and they, they classified it as a carcinogen. Who cares what they classified it as? That doesn't make it so. People can't just go around classifying things or themselves as whatever they feel like. Okay? Things are or are not. Classifications mean nothing. And there's no evidence to support a classification. So let's move on. Mean, meaning that it causes cancer. No, it doesn't mean anything of the sort. Cause and effect is established when a finding meets a number of absolutely un negotiable criteria. Failing any one of those, any possibility of cause and effect can be dismissed. And this fails. Let's move on. Again, this was mainly with colorectal cancer, but there was some evidence that the processed meat was also associated with stomach cancer. No, there wasn't. False again. And you haven't provided it. You've just said, in your opinion, there was some evidence that. Well, what was the evidence? Because I'm well aware of what the literature and the statistical inferences are in this area. I've looked at them very carefully over a period of time as a senior academic, I would suspect, lasting most of your entire lifespan thus far, love. If not all of it. No. No evidence exists for what you have just claimed at all. False. Yet with all this evidence... No, there is no evidence. Still, all this evidence, you haven't provided any. You've provided us with propaganda pieces, not science, not evidence. You have not established your case. You have spouted a theological bunch of claptrap. People are really still confused about why colorectal cancer is increasing in the United States. It's because they get misinformation from clowns, including yourself. As uh, per capita meat consumption also increases. Now we're going to discuss something very popular in our society today, which is protein. Mm -hmm. Everybody always asks vegan and vegetarians, where do you get your protein from? Well, what is protein? This is protein. It's just a series of uh, small molecules that can be linked together in various ways to produce almost anything that we need in our body.
And what is actually the prevalence of protein deficiency in the U.S.? So in medical school, we learned about something called kwashiorkor, which generally displays as someone who's really skinny with very low muscle and a big belly. This is because they don't have enough protein in their body to absorb the water back from their belly. So there's actually an osmotic difference. Now, in all the years that I've been in training in hospitals, I've never seen one case of this in the U.S. This is very rare. Contrary to all the hype that everyone needs more protein, most people in the U.S. actually meet or exceed their needs. Sure. Uh, for protein, which is especially true for males age 19 to 59. Uh, except, clearly, not Dr. Gregor doesn't have too much protein, it would seem. Who are usually the ones that are most concerned about protein deficiency. Overall, about 10 to 35 percent of your calories should come from protein, and this changes. 10 percent would be way too low for most people depending on what stage of life you're in. So for the average sedentary adult, they only need uh, 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. That's not enough. It's starting from... That's not enough to thrive and do well. That might be enough to stave off Quashi or core, but it's not enough to thrive and do well. The ages of 40 to 50, where it's more difficult to maintain your muscle mass, you'll actually have to increase this requirement to 1 to 1.2 grams. For people that are exercising all the time, this goes up to 1.1 to 1.5 grams. And finally, for those uh, regular weightlifters who break down their muscle all the time to build it back up, they just need 1.2 to 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Also, a common misconception in the animal agriculture industry is that only animal products are complete sources of protein. That's not a misconception. I was taught this when I was a major in animal science uh, back at Rutgers. And then I did some more research of my own, and I found that actually most beans, including soy, which is one of the biggest crops in the U.S. Uh, by volume, are complete sources of protein. And Just because all nine are present doesn't mean they are present in amounts sufficient to subserve needs for the individual amino acids such that it would require you to eat an unrealistically large volume of such things in order to gain sufficient protein to thrive. Ergo, there are no plant sources of complete, balanced protein. Okay, it's very, very straightforward to understand this, even if you really are a bit simple. What does this mean? It just means that they contain good proportions of nine of the essential amino acids. They don't, though. That the human body needs, that they can't produce on its own. And so I, I took all this research and I went back to my professor and I was like, did you know about all of this? And he just scratched his head and he said, no, I've never heard about this. I guess I need to update my PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> And he had been teaching for decades. So the misinformation in the animal agriculture industry. Love, if you live in a glass house, you ought not throw too many rocks. The level and amount of misinformation in the video that you have put together here that I've been critiquing today is beyond stunning. You are in no position to talk about misinformation. You should change your name to misinformation. Okay? Industry is strong. Also, uh, why do we need to care about complete proteins? We only need to care about complete proteins if we're eating a single source of food for our entire lives. Um, like if we're only eating wheat or we're only eating corn and not eating burritos that package it all together. This is just fine. Actual protein deficiencies are rare, irrespective of dietary habits. If you, if you define protein deficiency as the presence of quashi or core, fine. Nonetheless, there is no source of protein that you can find in a plant that would be sufficient for human needs. You have to combine and you have to know what you're doing. And as such, it leads 
to the requirement to consume an unnaturally large volume of so-called food that you actually can't absorb most of anyway, and that is full of toxins, anti-nutrients, pro-inflammatory nonsense, and contraindicated fiber. Enteric destroying fiber. Wow. <laughs> so most of us get all of our amino acids through uh, complementary proteins, which is um, foods with various profiles of amino acids that come together to give us all the essentials that we need. Next is one of my favorite. Oh, here we go. Thanks, which is fiber. Right. Let's see if she gets anything at all right in this field. Not as sexy. I'm not hopeful is protein in the U.S. arguably much more important. Fiber deficiency. Well, that's interesting. How can you be deficient in something that the exact dietary requirement for is not one single gram of it ever? There is no requirement in a human being for fiber in the diet at all, ever. Just the facts, though. Important. Many health conditions have been linked to a low fiber diet, including... Right. Well, so also sunburn has been linked with ice cream sales and fires have been linked with fire crews. Drownings in swimming pools have been linked to the release of movies starring Nicolas Cage. Perhaps we should outlaw all of those things. The last one I'd be for. Constipation, irritable bowel. In fact, there's one and only one remotely pseudoclinical study. It's the one covered by Dr. Paul Mason in his fine, fine video on the YouTubes, which you will find pretty easily if you put in Dr. Paul Mason and fiber in your search engines, and you'll see that the exact opposite is in fact true. There was a dose response uh, increase in constipation in people with the most fiber. The people that removed all the fiber from their diets in that study had a complete 100% remission. Every single one of those people of every symptom of constipation. Seems like it's a pretty strong influence, uh, inference that, that fiber is not particularly helpful in terms of motility of the gut. Okay, what's next? Syndrome, diverticulitis, heart disease, and some cancers, including colorectal cancer again. When again. All associative stuff, no cause and effect whatsoever. Healthy user bias, we're done. I was in training in rehab. We used something called the Bristol Stool Scale, and you can see that in the middle. Yeah, 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 nothing new here, but that's got nothing to do with being able to establish the need for fiber, because you don't need fiber still. Nurses would look at the patient's a stool every day. See, I, I every single day of my life, pretty much every morning, I have a type 3 normal bowel movement of moderate volume because there's not a lot of waste on a fully carnivorous diet, which is what I'm on. Uh, no straining, no stressing, no constipation, no problems, one and done. No fiber. No fiber to speak of for eight years. I know several people on the second, third, and indeed fourth decade. One in his fifth decade without eating fiber. All report the same. Perfect bowel function, the best it's ever been in their lives. Okay, so we're done with that. What's next? And categorize them based on how hard and lumpy they were, which correlates with constipation, to how soft they were, which correlates with diarrhea. And we put this right next to heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, temperature. It was the fifth vital sign to us. And it's uh, something that uh, many physicians have to manage in the hospital. And how do they manage it? They actually manage They mismanage it it by giving the patients more medication. So almost everybody that comes into the hospital gets put on a stool softener, which actually helps most people because they are constipated. Right, so why are most people constipated, do you think? Maybe it's because most people are told to stuff fiber down their gullet. The very thing that's very, very likely to be, I would suggest, given the study that Paul Mason has outlined, pretty likely to have something to do with it. Hmm. But the occasional person that has enough fiber in their diet and is not constipated then gets diarrhea. Constipation is a, a huge issue in the U.S. Oh, again, I wonder why. That we don't really like to talk about too much because we can fix it with medications. Or indeed by removing all the fiber from your diet. 
Whereas, like, if we just ate more fiber in no, our... No, that would make things worse, according to the one and only one even remotely pseudoclinical study that exists on this topic. Once again, Dr. Paul Mason and fiber are the search terms that you should punch into the search window in the tube of ubes, the ubes tubes, and you will see. Our diet that would bulk up our stool and regulate... Why on earth would you want bulky stool? Why in a purple fit would you want your stool to be bulky? Jeez, I wish my shit was bigger. Are you stoned? Goodness gracious me. It are uh, bowel movements naturally. Not to mention, there's the whole concept of gut microbiology. Oh, so God, here we go. Nobody knows anything much about this, let alone you, love. There's a lot of helpful bacteria that live inside our gut. Yes. While we ourselves cannot derive energy from fiber because it goes right through us. The <laughs> no, it sticks around, causes constipation, it would seem, as well as physical injury to the lining of the colon, inflammation and all the sequelae involved in that. In fact... The bacteria actually like to feed on this, and then... Well, if you feed your guts fiber, then obviously you're going to cultivate bacteria that like fiber. Don't do that, and you'll cultivate different bacteria, just as helpful to you. The, the, kind that like the kind of food that a human being is actually evolved and designed to consume, that being the meat and fat of large ruminant animals and not plants. All right? from the byproducts that they create that can provide all sorts of benefits to human health that we don't quite understand yet. There you go. It's, it's very, very clear from this presentation, Lovey, that you don't actually understand anything much at all. You're a trained, indoctrinated puppet of a hugely, hugely evil um, machine, really. You, you think of yourself as someone that's doing good works and helping people. You're not part of the solution at all. You are part of the problem. It's disgraceful. You should be ashamed of yourself, to be honest. And then going back to the concept of cholesterol. Uh, I thought we'd covered this. Usually fiber that exists in the gut can help absorb cholesterol that gets put out by the liver each time we eat a meal. So it can actually help to reduce cholesterol. Which is a bad thing. You don't want to, re to reduce your cholesterol. Top of everything. We'll go over micronutrient deficiencies that people on plant-based diets should look out for. Oh, right. Find me something that might be sensible. Right. Well, you can't get B12 on a plant-based diet. I'm mainly going to focus on B12. B12 is an essential vitamin that's mostly found in animal products, but is always only found with animal products. Originally synthesized by bacteria. Yes. Or yeast. It's always kept in our livers and we usually have enough to last us years. And so a common misconception among vegans and vegetarians is like, oh, I just maybe I just need to take a B12 supplement every couple of years uh, and then I'll be stocked up to go. <laughs> well, this is not actually true. Absorption levels can decrease with age. If we're not sure where we stand in our B12 levels, we can check quite easily using a blood test. No, you can't. No, wrong again. Some statistics, in the UK where fortification with B12 is a little bit more rare, 50% of vegetarians and 75% of vegans were actually found to be deficient or depleted of B12. And why do we care about this? Um, so there's the direct effect of B12 efficiency where we can uh, develop um, subacute combined degeneration, which is a neurological disorder, which can cause uh, pretty sudden numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, as well as muscle tightness. Uh, oftentimes this can be a medical emergency. And it can also cause uh, anemia where the red blood cells don't develop properly. And so we're not getting uh, good oxygen to, the, to our body. Also, this is a little bit high-level biochemistry. Having low B12 levels can lead to increased homocysteine levels, which is a molecule in the body that has been associated with um, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Again, no. 
Associations cannot inform on risk. Risk is still the conjugate of cause. Diabetes and dementia. So how do we fix this? Well, it seems pretty easy. We well, you eat a diet that's appropriate for your speciation. Okay. Just supplement with some B12. No, that's a bad idea. Because most of you will take the cyanocobalamin, which is the wrong form. Which not only won't do the job effectively, but will also cause a toxic reaction at some point. There are many supplements available uh, on the market. Some tips to follow is that you should make sure that your B12 is mixed with saliva first so that it binds with a protein called intrinsic factor so that we can actually absorb it. So the B12 pills where you just pop it in and it goes into the stomach, it, not a lot of that can be absorbed even if it's 10,000% of your normal B12 requirements. Um, and then also there's uh, two main types of B12 available on the market. There's um, cyanocobalamin and methylcobalamin, and it's often confusing uh, which one we should take. No, it isn't. Generally, the cyanocobalamin is more stable than the methylcobalamin and also tends to be cheaper. A lot cheaper. So uh, I actually took this from Dr. Grieger's video. When given the... Not Dr. Grieger, you mean? choice choose the cyanocobalamin and see oh my god are you serious <sighs> this woman literally knows nothing nothing how does a person like this get given a medical license how does that happen staff somebody explain this to me wow Save yourself some money. Finally. Oh my God. <sighs> Face palm. We're going to go over omega-3. Oh, this will be good too. So there's been many health articles published about uh, how omega-3s will prevent dementia. No, prevent is a cause and effect statement. No. And uh, do all these other amazing, give us all these other amazing health uh, outcomes. N no. There are no studies that suggest cause and effect relationships of any kind. And while it's true that um, omega-3s are found in many important tissues in our body, we actually have to look at the evidence. Well, go on then. When I went to look at the Cochrane Library, which is the highest level of like meta-analysis. No, it isn't. Not at all. No. Evidence. That's an opinion. in the U.S. It, it, it just, it, they don't come up with studies on their own, but they collect studies that are created from all over and they find the highest level ones and then... Highest level, boys and girls, and attack helicopters. I shouldn't leave you out, should I? They distill it down and tell us, like, what is found from it. For no, they don't. They don't do any such thing, in fact. Every single disease, it has never been shown that supplementing with omega-3 or having an omega-3 deficient diet is shown to increase or decrease the incidence of dementia, heart disease, stroke, or death. Well, the first thing you've said that's correct. Incredible. We've had to wait nearly 26 minutes in your video for a single statement that was remotely correct. Well done. I combed the internet for evidence and I couldn't find any. It's because it doesn't exist. Good. And why didn't you do the same thing for cholesterol and fiber, for example? Because it doesn't exist there either. Yet we're still talking about how essential omega 3s are. No, we're not. Some people are. I'm not. And there just seems to be a. They are an essential nutrient in very, very low levels. Luckily enough, sufficient can be found in the muscle meat of large ruminant animals. Discrepancy there. There's uh, 79 randomized studies involving 112,000 people that showed that this purported physiological mechanism of omega-3s helping our bodies doesn't really translate into real-world outcomes. Right, fine.
Plus, on top of that, we have no way of knowing if we're deficient in omega-3s because there's no simple, reliable blood test for it. Blood tests don't tell us anything about deficiency anyway. So that is my um, review of the science behind plant-based diets. Wow! There you go. One thing you got right in 26 minutes and 38 seconds. One. Everything else wrong. Completely, demonstrably, unequivocally, absolutely wrong. Dangerous, misanthropic, contraindicated disinformation of the highest order. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. This video was absolutely appalling from you. Please don't make any more public addresses to people about health or nutrition. You are a laugh. My people are laughing at you. Okay? The rest of you, you know the drill. See you next time. Don't let the door hit you in the backside on the way out. Enjoy the music on the way out the door. Make sure you clean up the room before you leave. See you next time when someone else will be wrong on the interwebs because it does not look remotely like slowing down anytime soon, does it? No. See you then. Two, three, four.